thrilled actually to be here uh, with you and the way, I mean, I would like to take you a bit with uh, two uh, stories. One is quite a long one for me and the other is this, a short story. One happened in Palestine, south of West Bank, in Fawar refugee camp and the other in Sweden uh, recently. And both of them maybe deals with almost the same a topic in a complete two different manners, and I would like a bit to discuss uh, this with you. And it's, it dealing, it's dealing majorly with how people that, ha that are not represented by a public and that are stateless, either stateless or refugees, are attempting to create their own public. And what does that mean? I mean, if you don't have a municipality that would manage that public, or that would create even that public, or that would initiate that public, what will be happening? Is there really collectivity that is going on beyond that uh, one way of uh, our understanding of public? And in that sense, I want to take you to two completely different places. One. Actually, the, the Fawar refugee camp is that deals completely with a complete lack of state, where you don't have, it is a complete informality and, and the place that is carved from the state uh, uh, borders. And the other, actually, it's, in the case of Sweden, is the uh, super presence of a state. And both of them actually create this uh, uh, this, you know, it pushed uh, both inhabitants to understand how they can deal with their uh, not belonging to that public. And what does that mean? I mean, and maybe the question in a very, very simple way, if you don't feel belonging to a public, what would be a possibility that you can deal uh, with that public? And I would begin from uh, Fawar refugee camp, and you know, that story began almost in 2008 when I first visited uh, Fawar refugee camp and I uh, was appointed as the head of camp improvement program, which was by itself, I mean, if you would think uh, camp improvement program, it was a program that was born out of a conference in Geneva, actually, in 2004, where many people uh, met that has to do with all the uh, you know stakeholders that deals with the palestinian right of return arab countries uh, the palestinian authority at that time uh, you know international uh, all other involved states and they come out with this statement that improving the daily life of refugees suppose not to jeopardize their right of return. And in that sense, I think that the attempt there was to disconnect the fact that refugees can eventually have a decent life, can still be claiming to live on a daily basis in a good manner. Nevertheless, this would not take away their status as refugees. And in a sense, I mean, I'm inviting you to think if uh, in, 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 in one way or another, we all have one image of refugees, the ones that are in, a, in extreme need to be relieved and in extreme need to be helped. And once they bypass this idea of being relief objects, we don't know what to do anymore with them. And they themselves even don't know what to do with themselves because in that sense, if they are performing this idea of being the relief uh, holders and the relief uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, subjects in that sense, then what is a possibility for them to still be acting with their own agency? So my question as the head of a department is that what should I do? Should, I mean, what does that mean? What is my role in all this? And, and how possibly you can do improvement? And I arrived to uh, uh, the camps, and of course they were su super suspicious in many ways. Is that why the UN, after all these years, after 50 years of being here, suddenly decided to improve the, uh, the, 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 the life of refugees, and then we came. I, I mean, I was naive uh, 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 as, as, as f soon as finished from an architectural uh, 
uh, uh, uh, department, happy of being there, sort of bringing the whole idea of participation. We are doing this improvement in participation, and they sort of came and say, what do you mean by participation? Wait a minute, I mean, participation, improvement, you are coming with all these suspicious terms and pretending that, you know, we are all neutral and naive to sort of accept to improve the life of the camp. And, and in that sense, what I guess what they were defending very much is the political notion of a refugee camp. And in that sense, what does that mean? And to take you into this journey of, uh, at least the journey of refugees, of Palestinian refugees, and then I would like to bring this back to Europe, uh, when Palestinian refugees find themselves in, um, in refugee camps after the 48, they sort of, they, they were convinced that the day after they are coming back home. No, this was the whole uh, convention and for the first years they were absolutely not even thinking that this will not be happening and holding the keys of their houses, uh, the documents and everything. And then times passed, passed uh, uh, there and they, and you know, there are a lot of Palestinian literature describing the winter and how hard was it to live in tents, that it was almost impossible, as if they were justific, they, they, we were justifying sort of why a house will be built instead of the tent, no? as if this was not even the right thing to do, because if you are a refugee, you need to live in a tent. If you are not living in a tent anymore, then you might lose your status as a refugee. So there was a lot of connection between being temporary and should, and your life should remain as a temporary life, and the fact that you need to live decently. No? And, and you, they had even to describe how harsh the winter was in order to build the four walls. Then, I mean, people uh, at, at that time, in the beginning of the 50s, decided to uh, replace the tent with four walls, and then they arrived to the roof. No? And there is, again, in, in many Palestinian literature, they were describing these big assemblies in refugee camps, and the whole idea was, should we or shouldn't we build a roof for our houses? And the decision, actually, the political decision was, we should not build roofs because the world will never recognize refugees with roofs. So they decided, matter of fact, as a, as a political strategy to be roofless. With all what this brought then later on in refugee camps, with, with all what also brought with me being there and coming and speaking about improvement, and they say, what is it? Are you here to build the roof? No, because in that sense, this was the whole thing is that, and maybe the whole Ginevra conference was about building the roof would not uh, actually exclude you from being refugees. No, so it's, you come out of this and then here I am heading the camp improvement program. Arrived to the camp, I would sit with the group of women and they would actually tell me, oh, we would love to have a place uh, where our kids can play and, and that it is in the middle of the camp that they would, uh, because the only places where the camp was able to actually create some small uh, playgrounds were, for kids was all the time on the edges of the camp where only kids over, males actually, over 14 years old would be able to go and, and play there. The, the females and the small kids were not able to do so. So they decided why, they told me that their uh, sort of desire was to have this small place where they can sit and play with their own kids. And, you know, as architects with my team, we interpreted this as that they would like to have a square or a, or a piazza in, in, the, in the camp. And we come back with, you know, this is great, you know, we would be having a piazza. And then everybody was so... Uh, shocked about is that what do you mean are we building a plaza now what does that mean in the camp we didn't want the roofs and now you are not even building the houses with the roofs you are even speaking about public spaces and who will be representing the plaza are we already sort of political body that can so in their mind anything that has to do with public space means that we decided that there is a political body that is representing this this 
plaza, no? this, this place that is out visible and that would give visibility to a certain collectivity. Because what really happened is that so far, the fact that they refuged within their shelters with what Anerwa called shelters is that means that all what they wanted from a refugee camp was to be sheltered. And here we are, we are speaking about it beyond after 60 years. I mean, they were living there for 60 years. After 60 years, we were questioning what is the collectivity in that camp? No, how can we understood and, and, uh, accept, and, and sort of uh, create, you know, if eventually it, it can be created, a public space in a refugee camp or a collective space or a common place in a refugee camp? And after a while, I mean, there was a complete, they spoke about it in the mosque, are we, uh, should we, shouldn't we? It was a big, a big discussion in the refugee camp, and they come back and say, okay, if we decide to do it, how we do it? You know, and there was, a, the camp was completely sort of almost in half, half wants it and half not, and here maybe it was my first encounter with what participation might look like. You no, know, I all the time intended participation in uh, uh, such, places, as, and this is what we all the time also learn on the papers, is that participation is about consensus. And you would discover, I mean, after a while of working in such harsh environments, is that there are certain projects where you would be having 100% consensus from all refugees. If you speak about sewages, if you speak about clinics, if you speak about uh, health, I mean, there are certain things that everybody would say, yes, sure, let's go for it. So you have complete consensus. And these are the things that people would list first, rightly, because in many ways, I mean, these are the basics that they want for their decent life. But then I discovered that participation is needed only and exclusively for such projects that would create conflict inside the community. And we intend, you know, we speak about community as if community is only about good things. You know, I do participation with the community, I went there, asked them. But the community is also made of a lot of power structure. You have men deciding certain things for women, you have women deciding certain things for their kids, you have many power structures that need to be actually challenged and, and rethought. And in a sense, taking the community as this body of marginalized people that needs to be heard and then you go back to your office and write what are their priorities and go back and do it to them is something that many do. I mean, in many uh, places in, in the rest of the world, but I felt personally that really the most interesting projects are the ones that creates conflict rather than the ones that creates consensus. And I was a bit, as of course my strategy as a head of a department was to combine both, is to come with a bunch of good consensus projects and to choose my battle. Now, if, if my battle is the square, then I put everything and I linked and I use my power, yes. I mean, I had no problem to say, is, sometimes is this neutrality, is that we all should be neutral when you are going to do participation, neutrality, neutrality, neutrality is your major uh, manifesto. I, I think that it's, you don't do participation when you are neutral. You do participation when you take a position, you as everyone else. And I, 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 in my work, I was taking certainly position in certain things. I was using my power and sometimes even using the budget that I would be having, using certain things, giving certain things for other things. I made alliances with some of the women that want certain things to happen or with some of other group that I felt that w they were vulnerable. And I was I was not neutral, no, and in that sense, you know, one of the major things that as official of you and they teach you from the first day you get in is that your best, what you are there, is to play neutrality. And I realize, I mean, neutrality has no, you cannot go to the camp and still pretend or think naively that you can be neutral. Anything that you will be doing would be taking a position. In that sense, and I decided I take my position for certain things that I should, I think they should be happening in the camp. But matter of fact, I mean, a, a long story short, the plaza was a, a major uh, controversy in, in the camp. And then they come and say, okay, we want to try. We want to go for this. We want to try to understand how to use, to, how to uh, create a plaza. But then they would come back to me and say, 
we need a closed plasma. And I was just like, what does that mean? I mean, how can I think about closed plasma? By definition, a plasma, I mean, if you go to any a uh, good manual of architecture or Wikipedia or any place, I mean, they will tell you that the plaza is by definition the open place, accessible by everybody that can have, uh, you know, that can include diversities and blah, 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 all this uh, where we can find about what a good public space might look like. And here am I faced by refugees after 60 years of refuge telling me that a plaza cannot be if not a closed one. And I was trying to understand what does that mean? I mean, how can I deal with all these uh, strange requests? And they explained to me. First of all, they asked me who will be managing the plaza? And of course, my, my uh, sort of official uh, answer to this is that, you know, I'm, I was heading at that point that department and UNRWA is officially in all its websites would say that they do not administrate camps. So no management, they only provide services to refugees, health, education services, but they don't manage the camp. So of course I say, of course, I mean, the people should be managing this place. And they say, if you want us to manage the place, it should be closed. And I say, can you please elaborate more? <laughs> what does that mean? And they explain to me is that if the people should be self-managing the place, there should be a threshold. There should be this moment of entering a place where this threshold would be where people will take responsibility of them getting inside this plaza. And then I sort of ask a bit more explanation and they began to give me examples. And one of the examples, many examples they gave me, but one of the examples they say, imagine a, a pregnant woman would get inside this plaza. She would decide to sort of enter this uh, place and she will be hit by a football. Who will be taking the responsibility for this? The family of the boy that hits her while he is in a place where he can eventually play, herself that she entered as a pregnant woman in a place where might be kids that are playing, or maybe the community would be understanding that this might be happening from the moment that you decide to get in, but they say if this woman would happen by chance and would not get herself into the door of this plaza, then we are in trouble. And this was for them, they were very clear in their way of managing the plaza is that each of us should take the responsibility of being and of entering and getting out from this place. So they wanted very clearly four walls and four doors. This was, and they sort of, we sat with them and everybody, I mean, they were all neighbors and everybody decided how high the wall should be in front of his or her own house. So some people would like to have more sort of, uh, you know, access to the plaza and others would say, no, I, I don't want to have anything to do. I want a complete closure. And they decided to build this uh, four walls and four um, uh, doors. But then, you know, looking at it, I was completely uh, and, and I didn't got, while we were speaking about closed plaza, I never connected this with the roofless house, no? It, it was completely as if I didn't do this click. And when I saw the project there on, on the mouse, I saw, oh my God, we are designing the roofless house. Because at the end, what they decided to do is they decided to create an atmosphere of a house where people will feel responsible of getting in and out. So they created a sort of most, mostly a place that is having a private sort of vest into a public. So in that sense, it was almost a big living room in a house that can host people in, in, in a sense where they would feel responsible to be hosted by this place. So we found ourselves in a sort of a roofless living room at a sudden. But then the question was, who will be uh, using this place? No? And at a sudden, I don't know why, for uh, 
A reason or for another, when the plaza became a true reality and we were seriously discussing about, about it, even the women that were pushing very strongly for it, a bit withdraw thinking that they don't know if they can really perform in the public this way. I mean, they, they sort of got a bit uh, scared and we were discussing, I was asking them, would you drink, would you go out for, to drink coffee together in, in this place? And they say, no, absolutely not, because this means that, uh, you know, it's, uh, that we are leaving our houses, our main work that we should do, and we are just going out for leisure and for spending time together. This is unacceptable. And, you know, Fawar is a very, very conservative society. So in many ways, the women is, is mainly for the domestic, and the men is the ones that, that are actually part of the public. So there was a very uh, clear distinction between the role of the women and uh, the role of the men. And then, you know, I continued digging on what are the things that they will, and then I asked, would you be going to uh, cook together? And I say, absolutely no, because this is also a ledger thing that we will be doing, we will be enjoying our time. And then at a sudden I would ask, but would you see a, a, a film there, a documentary? And they say, yes, if it is a documentary about healthy food for our kids or how we raise our kids or educational uh, documentary, absolutely we can go. As long as it is a cultural event and not a ledger one, we are permitted, but not in order to go out and have fun. So this was a bit of an entrance for, uh, for me to begin to understand, okay, what, what, how can we translate uh, all this? And in the meanwhile, I mean, six years, we are speaking, uh, you know, I say all the time, this is the most banal ever place that you would, in, I mean, as, uh, speaking as architects, we are speaking about four walls and four doors, literally. I mean, the most banal thing that you can ever design, it took us, seven years to fulfill it, seven whole years of discussion, of thinking, of, and in the meanwhile, actually, there was two small shelters that the community decided to take and to compensate, and we opened up all the issue of compensation in UNRWA. We managed to buy these two shelters to destroy them. So it took us a whole seven years to sort of uh, uh, being able to create this uh, Square, and in the meanwhile, we created a university in the Haitian refugee camp. I would not sort of, I mean, many, many things happened in the meanwhile, uh, but I will only tell you the story of uh, this place. And in, in the university, in campus in camps, which is the university in the refugee camp, and it was all about how can we create knowledge about refugee camps and what kind of knowledge production it might be and how can we understand all this because you know we realized after a while that we were witnessing certain things without names no and we felt that what is needed is a sort of a place where we can create a collective dictionary where we can create uh, collective concepts that we can understand many things that are happening in front of our eyes that have no theory behind. And we are normally used to the contrary, is that there are a lot of theory that would almost proceed what is happening on the ground, while in the refugee camp we were seeing many things that were happening and less names through which we can use to understand what, what, was, uh, uh, what, what is happening there. So, uh, we established campus in camps, and I cannot here speak about campus in camps, but what happened is that we recruited one, two actually, girls from Fawar refugee camp. One of them is called Ayat, and Ayat immediately actually came on board, and her main project in life was to become the creator of a movement in Fawar refugee camp for the right of the women to be in the public. And they sort of occupy this place, and began to sort of find ways, playing yoga, uh, all types of ledger that you can ever imagine, cooking, uh, uh, and, and, she, she's, and she has also a lot of young generation with her that not only women, they become a sort of a group of young people that are defending their new way of willing to live the camp. And at this point, I mean, two years ago when I visited Fawar refugee camp, there is now another major struggle of the old generation wanting to put the roof on the plaza, so to close it, because they felt this was going way beyond 
what they imagine, it's transforming the whole thing, and this young generation taking this plaza as a way to a free billion, and the same exact people that was telling me, are you, are you building a roof finally in, in, in the camp, were the ones now willing to build the roof on top of this uh, square, which was for me completely amazing. And I reminded them, and they were saying, no, but things just escaped from our hands. We didn't imagine such a place where a mixture of men and women, young people are all there. And so in that sense, I think, uh, you know, this place is in a continued transformation and also questioning how a community can still be, uh, you know, collectively discussing how they can be living. And in, in that sense, you know, it was this sort of place between the private and the public that permits such a community to sort of self-organize itself and that in, in, uh, in a sense to create um, such collectivity. But here, I mean, I, I would like to jump with you, it, it's, uh, uh, to jump with you from the living room in uh, Fawar refugee camp to the living room in Buden, which is the extreme north of Sweden. And bear with me, I mean, it's, it's also a bit of a long story, so you will hear two uh, long stories. I mean, I will try to make it short because I, uh, I feel I'm really sort of grabbing all your uh, energies. So, Boden. Now, after all, I, I spent almost um, 12 years working in Palestinian refugee camps, and, and we felt, you know, in, in the last period, we felt that, uh, especially for what was happening in Europe and the whole crisis of uh, what they call crisis of refugees, in a sense, was more, I think, a cultural crisis of, uh, you know, maybe for the first time, I would say the whole, uh, you know, idea of decolonization is finally inside Europe and not anymore in the colonies all over the place. And, and of course, you know, what's happening is that refugees are not respecting what Europe designed for itself as a border, and they sort of come in, and they come in in many ways in their also um, on terms, and I feel that what really, what is uh, happening with, especially with the Syrian refugees arriving and Iraqi refugees arriving, they don't perceive themselves only as migrants. They are still, as in the case of refugees in Palestine, they still feel that they have a very strong political agenda. No, it's, and they are not only coming for economical reason, for how much Europe would like to describe this as only a sort of another uh, migration uh, um, period. It's not. This, we are speaking about people that are even not sure if Syria would tomorrow become again a place where to come back. I'm not sure. I mean, many refugees would come back. So they are here because they are political refugees. Not because they think that it is the paradise where they uh, be arrived, even if some people would still be having this. I'm not saying it's not. But in that sense, I think that the serious crisis is that we are speaking about political refugees and how to deal with these political refugees. And then we decide for one reason and another that it's the battle is majorly now in... Uh, in uh, we feel that the battle is now in Europe. And, and the whole uh, idea of understanding what is happening with refugees is more here than... So, matter of fact, we took our decision. We want to go to Sweden. And uh, I got a commission from uh, a public, the Public Art Agency, which is an agency within the Swedish government dealing with public art, to work in Boden. And Boden is, uh, and I think that, you know, the, the, they invited me because in a sense it's, uh, Dar is a very strange practice that works from one side with military camps and military uh, structures and colonies and from the other uh, side with refugee camps. And Boden is perfectly this. Boden was created in, uh, in the north of Sweden as this place to protect Sweden from the war, no, from the Cold War uh, during the um, 
uh, you know, during the, during the era where the Cold War was, was coming, they were afraid that Russia might be invading uh, uh, Sweden, so they decided to build in that northern part the whole this basement military uh, camp in, uh, in there. And, uh, you know, the first time, and they asked me if I will be uh, happy to be commissioned, and I say, I need to visit the place first. I mean, I'm not sure what is it. I, I was unable even to imagine what Budin is. They were telling me about this uh, place that was military base. So I was imagining only military base. But matter of fact, I arrived to Budin last November, mid of November, and it was uh, the first day of snow in that place. And it was beautiful. I mean, I mean, in all senses, I was thinking I'm arriving to this military place full of refugees, and I saw one of the most beautiful landscape ever. And for some reason, I don't know if it was really uh, by choice, or the, we were in four people, and they took us to see all the military uh, base of Boden with a bus of 50 passengers, and we were only four. And the bus was really the, the last vehicle, I think, that can be going into this strange and, you know, for one reason or another, or they expected much more people to come, or they thinking the government is arriving, so maybe a bus would be representing better the government. Matter of fact, I found myself into this big bus, alone with the driver and three, not knowing where to sit, and they were taking me to this bunkers and undergrounds, and it's, it was really, I mean, from one side the snow and from the other side these places that were intact completely and with all these mannequin soldiers and the doctor, with all, they recreated the whole scenes of how was the life for the soldiers during that period of, uh, of them being in Boden. So you will be seeing the dentist opening the, the mouth of one of the soldiers, you would see them eating, you would see amazing places and amazing uh, scenery, no? In, um, in many ways. And then, you know, I, they were speaking and speaking about the war and how to protect uh, uh, Sweden from the war and everything. And at a certain point, I looked at them and told them, but the war never arrived. And they were almost disappointed. No, is that, imagine, because in a sense, if you built a place with the purpose of protecting from a war that never arrives, you feel yourself completely losing your purpose of existence, no? And I was a bit struggling with them, telling them, but refugees arrive. And they say, it's true, but you know, I mean, in, in that sense, I felt that there was a complete crisis of narration, also because, you know, they were showing me, or it Boden, when the Berlin Wall falls, they destroyed 25% of its housing because they understood that the, wall is not, the war is not arriving, and then, you know, it was a moment of sadness, paradoxically, for the, for the, the, the city, because it, it completely collapsed. I mean, the wall of Berlin collapsed, and Boden collapsed with it, because what is it that we are doing? And of course, because it is this military base, it's the perfect place to host refugees. So a lot of refugees that arrive to Sweden arrive first to Boden, and they are kept there normally, while they are asking for their uh, uh, asylum seeker, that sometimes it might take for four or three years. So they are there in this, in the middle of nowhere, because it's true that it's amazing uh, uh, landscape, but at the end of the day, they have basically nothing to do. They arrive to what they imagine the paradise in, uh, in uh, Europe, and then they found themselves in the middle of basically nowhere. But then finished that day, I told them, listen, I need really to see real life. Take me to see some refugees, because otherwise I even don't know how to imagine Budin. So the day after would take me to what they call the yellow house. And the yellow house is, and they use the English word for the yellow house. And when, uh, when ref Syrian refugees would speak with me, they would use the English word. And when Swedes will speak with me, they use the English word of the yellow house. They have a yellow house, they have a red house. And these, I mean, there are 1,000 yellow house in, uh, in Boden, but there is one only yellow house because this is where refugees live. No? It, it's become like the place that is discriminated by the rest because this is where 
refugees arrive, this is where, uh, you know, the malavita, this is where thing discriminate, I mean, this is where uh, shooting might take, I mean, all what you can imagine coming with uh, refugees. So I would arrive to this yellow house, and, you know, I, I think that maybe I never witnessed such depression in my entire life. I mean, it's the most depressing place that you can ever visit. You got inside and refugees are depressed, thinking, why did we come all this way to find ourselves in the middle of nowhere? There is no place where they can go out to. No place. I mean, the maximum that the, the men would go down to, to have their cigarette in the super cold of Budin. The women are all the time in, with, with the kids in that uh, uh, room, enclosed in what they would give them normally, one room. And they were completely... Um, you know, all of them were thinking when the day will arrive when we leave Budin. And I thought, you know, at least in Palestinian refugee camps, there was potentiality. They were fighting, they were political agents, they wanted to change. Here, I don't see nothing of this. I only see depressed people thinking about the day they will leave this place. So it's, I thought there is no way, I mean, no way that nothing can be done here. And I, I was thinking, you know, it's really beyond my, and I was thinking, you know, it's not, you cannot be optimistic all the time, as we all the time used to say, you can find all, all the time way to do things. There I thought in Budin there is nothing that can be done. No, it's first of place, first of all, it was built for a non-purpose, and then they bring refugees to torture them here. So <laughs> what, what is it that I can ever do in Budin? Come back sleep in my hotel, there is only two hotels in, uh, in Budin, and the hotel closed like at 5 p.m., they give you the keys. So I open the keys, I come inside this sad hotel, sit in my living room, thinking, oh my God, I mean, wh where I am, is, is it really r real or uh, I'm dreaming? The day after, I would wake up and say, you know, I should not give up. I, I, I thought, okay, I would go and ask one question, then I know that the answer would be no, but I thought, okay, I, I would really try. I went around again to the Yellow House, asking them if they know anybody that wants to stay among refugees in Boden. And to my extreme surprise, they told me, yeah, yeah, Brahim and Yasmin. And I was just like, wait a minute, who am I? I thought maybe they would save, be saving me, Brahim and Yasmin. So, and, and, and we began to look for Ibrahim and Yasmin desperately, you know, as almost looking for two treasures in the city. I know nothing, knowing nothing what I will be finding with Yasmin and Ibrahim, but certainly I thought they have a reason of why they want to stay in Modin. So in that sense, finally, Ibrahim will answer his phone 2 p.m., and we went to visit the house of Yasmin and Ibrahim. We enter into the house of Yasmin and Ibrahim, we will find Yasmin, Brahim, the mother of Yasmin, and a baby girl, I mean, she's seven years old, her name is Ling. And of course, I get in, and I felt good. You know, there was something there. It's, I, I felt finally, you know, the same potentiality that somebody can ever find. And I began to speak about them, we began to speak about life, I told them, you know, your daughter is the same age of mine, and then they stopped me after three minutes and they told me, uh, she's not our daughter. And I was just like, what do you mean? Who is she? And she says, this, she's the cousin of Yasmin, escaped in the same boat of Yasmin and Ibrahim while her parents were in another boat. She has been with them for the last two years and a half, and she was doing the family reunion for her family, and that they supposed to arrive in a few months. And actually, they arrived only the last month that I met them in, uh, in Budin, finally arriving to meet uh, their daughter. But I thought there was something there, and I can tell you where I felt really this thing happening. We entered in the house of Yasmin, and I was with two people that were representing at that moment the Swedish public art government. So, I mean, representative from the government. We get inside, and at a sudden, Yasmin and Brahim were hosting us. So they were asking, should we take away our shoes? Should we keep our shoes? They were a bit understanding what we were speaking about. I had a bit to translate, so they felt completely foreigners, not speaking Arabic. The food was not familiar. So I looked at them and I saw, wow, in one second, in only entering one door, 
the sweet government became foreigner. And Yasmin and Ibrahim are hosting the Swedish government. So for me, this was really completely, I thought, okay, I can certainly do something here. And in that sense, I began to, uh, and, and you know, I, I immediately offered Yasmin to work with us, and of course she was shocked. She says, I, I immediately offer a job with the government, and they say, wait a minute, they are undocumented, we can find it, we can, I mean, how can we do a, 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 a contract with refugees uh, that just arrive and say, you know, the project would be completely depending on this, no? We need Yasmin to work with us, and was Yasmin was asking me, what do you want me to do? I mean, and it happened that, of course, to my, Great luck, Yasmin was an arch is an architect. So in that sense, I, am, I didn't design it, really. It, it's real. All what I'm telling you happened. And, uh, so Yasmin was an architect, and I asked her if she can work with me. And she began uh, slowly, slowly to... Uh, and she asked me, what do you want? And I said, I want you to collect for me some stories of refugees that are living in Budin. I want to understand what is happening in Budin. And she began to... Uh, collect stories, and then at a certain point I felt, you know, I wanted very much to speak with her, but I felt, you know, I am someone that have some problem of accepting the silent. I feel that if somebody is silent in front of me, he is in a bit of difficulty, and I sort of jump into the whole thing and begin to speak, and I thought that if I will be doing this with Yasmin, I will go nowhere, because I will be the one speak. I, I feel that she's not really somebody, she would answer yes, no, this is her way of doing, and I thought, if we will speak via Skype, we will go nowhere, I will get nothing out of this character that I have, I will have silent for three minutes and then immediately. So uh, we decided, actually she, su she suggested it, why don't we write to each other? So we began to write through Messenger and to tell each other stories and uh, um, I will finish in five minutes, I think I'm... Uh... So we began to tell each other uh, stories, and the first story that she sent me was a story of a Somali woman. And you know, again, I was just like, you know, this is incredible, no? Uh, you just met someone that offers you a job with the government. And the first thing that you are tested around is the first story that you are uh, actually writing. And instead of going to the 1,000 Arab refugees that are all over the place, from Iraqi to Syria, and to, she would go to a Somali woman that she hardly can speak with. And I was just like, Yasmin, can you please explain me what is going on here? I mean, why did you do this? I mean, how did you speak with her by first place? And she says, I mean, she fled, she fled through Libya. And then uh, she speaks some small Arabic, uh, English, and then we learned some Swedish. So she was completely struggling with three languages that none of them speaks well. And I was just like, why didn't you go for a Syrian story? And she says, you know, I live this story. I know what is it. It's, and I am really troubled to understand why ever other people will go into such a choice. No? So she was so curious about who are the other people that are around and why refugees would go for such a choice, no? And it was amazing to begin to receive all these uh, stories from Yasmin, but then something small happened. She would come to me and say, you know, I'm a bit troubled because I feel that refugees are, question, are questioning why a refugee woman would collect other refugee stories. If she's not the researcher, she's not the artist, she's not, she's a refugee. And you know, we are also used in such places like Syria, Iraq, and other places that there are what we call the spies of the government. So they thought, wow, she is now working with the Swedish government to learn about our real stories rather than the fake stories that we are speaking about in, for our uh, uh, documents, no? So they were a bit afraid. And what Yasmin and her mother did to overcome this, they opened their living room to the other women. So they began to drink with them some tea, coffee in the morning, inviting them for some chats. And instead of, uh, and what happened is that then the women asked Yasmin to begin to write their story. So I felt again this back, the whole living room coming into creating uh, this collectivity. And then the whole project of the living room is built 
on that fact that refugees in their private, and again, you know, as the plaza was a sort of overlapping between private and public, in Boden it's a bit of reverse where refugees felt that in their private, if they would open their private to the public, if they would open this room, the, and that what we call in Palestine and in the Arab world the room of hospitality, which is for the guests. And in that sense, I understood that the real, real struggle for refugees is how they can belong to the Western public space. No, and in that sense, you know, they are required constantly to behave as guests, as eternal guests, in the Swedish public space means and you know how many uh, rhetorics around if they are in our place they should behave the way we should behave they should uh, you know know how they there are rules and regulations and god and codes that would oblige anybody actually to behave as a guest and you are all the time feeling am i performing as a good guest or not because at the end you are hosted by these governments and in a sense, I feel that the major struggle for refugees here is their basic right to host. And I even don't know that, that don't, I mean, I'm even reflecting on the fact if even the Western citizens were expropriated their rights to host, because if you would think what happens in Denmark, for example, when people were trying to help refugees and were hosting them in their own houses or taking them in their own cars. There was a moment where they say that this would be an illegal act, means that private people, normal citizens, cannot host in their private, and the only one that is entitled to host are the host governments. And in that sense, I feel that what happened with refugees is that if hospitality became only a public domain, in a sense of a state domain, and what refugees are, where refugees can only got their agency, when they got back their, uh, uh, their, their right to host, their basic right to host. So I accept personally to be a guest, and, and in that sense, I felt it's all only my, uh, my main dilemma in Sweden, and I ask myself why I wasn't happy to go to Sweden. I think I wasn't happy to go to Sweden because I didn't want to live an eternal life of a foreigner, because this is what the country is offering me. And I thought that if I can myself be hosting, opening my living room to host, understand who are these parallel living rooms, and give visibility to certain attempts of hosting, we can still be understanding how a parallel uh, uh, public spaces can be uh, invented. And I all the time feel that this overlapping between private and public permits certain agencies to take. So the condition of the overlapping of the private and the public is this architectural condition and this threshold uh, feeling where you have people that feel that they have agency in this place would give some refugees back their agency to uh, host. And when I told Yasmin, you know, I would like to, to entitle the project The Living Room, she says, I love it because it's still the Syrian living room in Sweden, and I still want to combine my both lives in that sense. So I am very much into this um, new project of understanding again how this proliferation of uh, living rooms that can create other types of publicness and other lives of collectivities that can actually take place wherever we are. There are Yasmin and Brahim everywhere. And all what we need is to give these places visibility and to recognize them. And the fact that it is a commissioned by the Public Art Agency and by the government of Sweden, I am really aiming to recognize this also in a sort of almost official manner, to say, are we able to accept that there are more than one type of a public or we are not there yet and we cannot host refugees if uh, we, can, we can only host refugees if and exclusively if they only accept their vest as a guest. And this is for me still the major question to uh, deal with since I arrived here. Thank you.
Are there questions? Um, maybe if you want to take the time to think about one, I have a question to you about the general condition of the whole refugee situation. Politically speaking, there seems to be a split between two positions, how to deal with the refugee condition right now. Um, let's say almost all European states try to install a, a policy where they reject refugees as much as possible, tightening borders, keeping people out as much as possible, as if this could stop them. On the other hand, there's a couple of scientists, refugee um, experts, who say no matter how hard you make the borders, immigration will still continue to happen. How would you consult, let's say, Angela Merkel on choosing her refugee policy for the next 20 years? Making borders even harder or trying to figure out how our context can absorb more migration? I would actually try to a bit uh, uh, return the question within another question. I think that here we are not speaking about borders, we are speaking if Europe is ready to recognize its colonial past or not. This is mm -hmm. all what is, it, what is it about. In that mm -hmm. sense, uh, you know, in, in many ways, I think that the struggle is what we are living is a sort of a post-colonial era where what, co what colonialism tried to put on place after the end of uh, the so-called colonialism collapsed mm -hmm. you know, in, in all these places. And this collapse has a sort of, uh, you know, side effects on Europe. And refugees are feeling that this is the place where they should head to. So the question here is that Europe would still like to keep its super fortress things and still thinking that there is one major center and then these places should be stay completely away or is there a possibility for Europe to rethink its and to, to actually uh, have time to internalize what happened and to process it and to accept it and I'm, I'm now asking for example I mean why all what you have in the museums big part of the museums is Egyptian or Iraqi uh, collection no and as an Iraqi person, I would say, or as an as a, uh, Egyptian person, I would say, I have the right to come and see my own art. What, what, we, what we do with this? I think it's not, it's not a question of opening or closing the border. Europe is in front of a very important historical moment where they are faced by their colonial past, and they so far doesn't want to admit it. And I think it's, I, I, I cannot answer open or close. I would tell you, begin, to dig as Europe, I mean, I'm speaking about politicians and politics, begin to accept that you are not only the inventors of modernism, but you are also the inventors of colonialism. So you should click these two. You cannot only see yourself as only the one that is bringing civilization to the people, but that also destroyed part of the world. And the problem is that Europe is, would like only to be proud about its modernis, modernism uh, era rather than about its colonial past. And uh, it's a time where things are coming together and uh, it's a time to revise the whole card, I think. Keep mm -hmm. the But maybe just in, in reaction to your exchange, um, in Europe it is quite striking that it is the countries um, in the east of Europe who are the fiercest closing off and, and who, are the, who, are, who show the most fear of the foreigners. And so Poland, Hungary and so on, and these were hardly maybe the colonial powers of the uh, 20th century. And yeah. maybe the countries like, okay, France, uh, uh, Germany uh, show a little bit more openness um, towards um, people coming in. Yeah, but I, I would actually revise it a bit differently. If, if you, I think that one, one of the things that is completely created with the arrival of refugees is the war between the poorest of the poor. No, it's, it's instead of creating solidarity between 
certain people, what is created is a sort of a more, uh, uh, you know, if, if they would be coming, they would be taking what eventually is just like, sorry, it's, it's the, there is no solidarity rather than it's more I want to identify myself with modernity. So, of course, because you are more fragile than any other center that feels modernity comes from there, is that what you do is that you completely push into this and you want to identify yourself with moder ma modernity and you would never identify yourself with a, a struggle to decolonization because if this would be seen as a struggle of decolonization, then all the things would be changing. And, it, and I think that it's quite complicated. It's not an easy uh, thing, absolutely, but I, I have a, a, a feeling that it's, it's all about you know, the position of, uh, of Europe and how they manage to convince certain fragile communities is that their salvation is only and exclusively by buying this one successful model. And I think this is from where it uh, comes, most probably. No, um, I was just wondering, because you um, asked the question in uh, return, and then um, at that time when colonization ha was happening, also this question of borders was really different. I mean, we're not speaking of France or Germany, how it's now, it was, I mean, that borders were shifted, and so I'm questioning borders. That was just meant to be a, common, a comment, but I was just thinking of that. What role can architecture play in the fashioning of such conditions? I mean, when we look at these things, it seems to be a zone where architecture is absent. Is that so? How do you see this as an architect yourself involved in this? I'm also asking it because you, you didn't, I mean, you chose not to really show these conditions like in detail, especially one in Sweden. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the one in Sweden, I'm still uh, yet um, at the beginning, and I like much more the idea of bringing people with me in, in my uh, own narration, so this is why I choose by uh, default not to show um, images, but I would like to answer to this question to architecture. I think that architecture can play uh, a potential role. It's not that, uh, and of course, with these, with what is possible. I'm not saying that architecture can be a solution, but architecture can give sometimes certain forms for certain uh, struggles to take place. And in that sense, for example, in the case of Fawar refugee camp, this very basic form of architecture is creating since 10 years a sort of complete uh, transformation in the, in, in the society. And then when you ask them, I mean, and, and, and you, you, I, I would question, is it the plaza or is it something else? And of course, the plaza created a condition from where actually they realized that it is possible to have other place rather than institutions that were controlled by an older generation. So this place created this momentum where people gathered together and decided to do something. Well, in the form of the living room, you know, everybody was speaking about hospitality and in that sense, you know, the whole, uh, everybody is coming back to Derrida and hospitality and Derrida. And I was asking myself, what are also an architectural form? In that sense, you know, I, I would like to comment a bit on this because in, in a sense also Derrida was very much speaking to the West on how can we still save the West from itself by putting hospitality forward by putting hospitality uh, actually on top of the rest of the law, as this is a way to sort of understand Europe in a better manner. But in that sense, it was all the time about Europe. And, and the question that I'm posing here, is it ever possible to understand hospitality as a way to gain agency for the ones that have no agency in that moment? Because it, it will reverse the whole thing. And in that sense, architecture has 
a potentiality because the living room might be a form where Yasmin and Brahim can begin to actually adoperate from. And, and now we are building an, an, a living room outside in the uh, yellow house in order for Yasmin and Brahim to open it to the public. So in that sense, I think that without uh, a space, I mean, sometimes certain struggles are, can be more difficult because I, I, I believe sometimes that without the camp, people would not have been, uh, would not have had the possibility to struggle in the same way. Without maybe this plaza and, and, it, and without the living room. So, so certain forms of architecture can propose uh, certain forms of doing. So I'm not completely, I, I think that if you want to speak about the public space that is in the heart of the political struggle, architecture needs to be present. Any other comments? Maybe one more question along similar lines of um, you represented an agency in the beginning which has this beautiful name of camp improvement camp, camp upgrading improvement. camp improvement um, agency which is um, quite bizarre and uh, somehow you were representing it uh, and this notion of improvement you you mentioned very nicely how how conflictual it is um, or how contradictory uh, it is. Um, uh, because with every kind of improvement comes stability and, and this notion of permanence and temporality becomes more and more um, uh, kind of contradictory or become, comes, becomes confused. Um, did your position change over time or, or do you see a, a way of, of resolving this or do you see the, this plaza that you, that you produced as one way of resolving this contradiction between permanence and, and temporality that is somehow um, accentuated through this notion of um, improvement? Yes, in, in a sense, I, I don't, you know, one of the projects, maybe I didn't mention here, but one of the projects that we uh, sort of, after many years of being in the camp and thinking how can we represent uh, this notion of permanent temporariness, we come out and we were questioning how can we design a place for the uh, university to, to take place in the camp, campus in camp. And we come out with a concrete tent, which is a place where, I mean, you can see that the camp is made of tent, even if it's made of concrete. And in a sense, I think that architecture can help into creating certain discourses around which you don't need to live without sewages, to say that you are in a concrete tent. But you can create your own sort of uh, places that can still be speaking on your behalf. And in, in a sense with refugees, we were even discussing, one of the major things that they were all the time telling me is that, you know, more strong we are, more we can defend our rights. And not the other way around how they convinced us, is that more we are hungry, more rights, rights are a luxury. Defending rights is a lot of time also it can be seen by refugees as a luxury because in that sense you only react. And they say, how can we be strategic political players and not only re reacting to our hunger and anger? And in that sense, I think, you know, I was saying that if I would be having enough money, I would have done this plaza with marble rather than, in, in a sense, to also to show this, uh, and maybe in, in that sense this comes our last project when we decided to go for uh, uh, now the nomination of the Haitia refugee camp in the UNESCO, because it was a way to say how can you give value to such life in exile? Because the problem is that because it is this permanent temporaneous condition, what happened is that you throw 70 years of life in the garbage and as if they value nothing, even from refugees themselves, you know, they even denied their right to recognize that their life has value. And, and in that sense, it's super problematic. So how can you create a complete different version where you say it's even the contrary? You know what? In Palestine, there is a law where anything that is over 50 years old can be recognized as a heritage. 
The Haitia refugee camp is 70 years old. Should we recognize this as heritage? This is part of the Palestinian history. Where you put it, you throw it in the garbage. And in that sense, I think that if you would make out of the refuge a value that would get people out of this slavery that it's only their own miserable body is what describe them and what make the world recognize them as refugees, if they have other types of representation that would give them freedom of not being only that type of refugees, I think we are contributing a lot. And I think architecture in that sense has a lot of power to sort of go into this direction.